We're here with Bart Lee at the California Historical Radio Society Museum in Alameda, and he would like to say a few things about the earliest wireless on the West Coast. Yes, we're very fortunate here uh, at Alameda at, at our museum that we have access to a lot of these very early materials and we also have access to an awful lot of the history of what was going on here in California. The, uh, we, call, we talk about wireless, it was wireless telegraphy. It was, of course, wired telegraphy from Morse um, in the middle of the 19th century and then Marconi and a few other people figured out that they could send telegraphic messages without wires. Uh, a considerable advance at the time. Now we're not talking about radio broadcasting or music or anything like this. We're just talking about messages going back and forth. And so in, in 1899 uh, the, uh, a California regiment was coming back from uh, the Philippines from the Spanish-American War and the uh, Spanish-American War had ended in 1898 I believe the local newspapers wanted to have um, advance notice if possible as to when the troop ship would get here and there was no way to do that of course there was no radio on the troop ship uh, so they knew by cables when the troop ship had left the Philippines but not when it would come to San Francisco and it's not like you could go out and look for it because there's nothing but fog out there so uh, a high school teacher had knew about Marconi's work and decided that what he would do is uh, suggest a way to send a message from a light ship uh, that's about seven or eight miles out in the fog to back to uh, San Francisco so the newspapers could get the story. So, so they, would, um, uh, they would be able to prep the town for the big party that was inevitably going to happen. So uh, they did, they, they, they put it on a light ship, which is a predecessor of the Coast Guard. And the light ship is out there with a big foghorn, basically, and it spotted the ship. And uh, the, the telegraph operator on the ship sent the message, Sherman is spited, spotted, that was the name of the ship, Sherman is, is spotted, and the town just went wild. So this got worldwide publicity about this use of wireless telegraphy here in San Francisco. And one of the most important things that it did was it stimulated the imaginations of so many local people, mostly young men, of course, but uh, they began to see uh, wonderful possibilities in, the, in, the possi uh, in wireless telegraphy. And it wasn't that hard to do, it turned out. And so by 1903 through, you know, 1906, 1907, there were all sorts of young men in San Francisco experimenting with wireless telegraphy. Now, the marine industry, of course, picked this up right away because was, this was the way to stay in touch with ships at, at sea. And so there were companies here in San Francisco that wanted to make uh, instruments for marine communications, land and ship, uh, and they'd be perfectly happy to sell them to the Navy or whatever, but uh, they focused on marine communications. Now, one of those companies made this object. This is what's called a loose coupler and it was made by Halcon, and that was George Haller and Elmer Cunningham. Uh, Elmer Cunningham later became a very high official of, of RCA. And what this device does is it is essentially a way to tune the frequency of a receiver. Now in those days, we didn't have, they didn't have radios and they didn't have radio tubes, although we'll talk about those. But they had uh, what were called crystal detectors. And this is an example of a crystal detector. It's just a little tiny bit of galena with a little tiny pin on it. And it turns out that if you put this in a circuit with a tuner and an antenna and a pair of headphones, of course, then you can uh, hear the wireless messages. So this was, this was not that much gear when you think about it. And so uh, this became a very popular way to tune these early wireless receivers. And we'll talk a little bit about other things later. But uh, <clears throat> this uh, kind of gear, this is definitely pre-World War. It's about 1916, as far as I can tell. Uh, and there were, there were other people doing, doing kind of similar things. Now, there were commercial companies that wanted to do wireless out here in the West Coast, too. And one of them set a station up in uh, the Palace Hotel. And this was station PH, which later became KPH and, and very famous. And PH uh, moved from the Palace Hotel after the earthquake in 1906, moved to Russian Hill, and ultimately moved to Daly City and then further up north to Bolinas. 
But that was a station that was the only, one of the only ways that ships could communicate if they were in the Pacific with the American landmass was through PH or KPH. And uh, it was a very famous station in its day. So, and the same sorts of things are happening on the East Coast too, and in Europe. So uh, marine communications became very important in early wireless. The, the, the capital involved in marine communications was very, very substantial. The, the, ship, the shipping lines had to pay. Uh, they knew they had to pay. They had to have the communications. And then after the Titanic hit the iceberg in 1912, the law required um, all ships um, of any size whatsoever to have wireless capabilities and to have two operators and all of that sort of thing. So there was a huge industry developing. It was always the hope that you could send signals, say, from California to Hawaii to Japan because there was a lot of commercial nexus into the Far East. And so uh, when RCA, well, the predecessor of RCA, which was American Marconi, started building a very high power station just north of San Francisco in Bolinas. And that was so high powered, it was known as the rock crusher. It was 300,000 watts. Maybe it only operated at 250 most of the time, but it was loud enough so that you would go deaf if you weren't protected and you would go blind from the ultraviolet light and the sparks. Now, we'll talk a little bit about sparks, but the spark was a device that was literally a spark that helped to generate the radio waves that then went through the tuning circuits out to the antenna. Uh, and what you heard when you, he when you heard something like this through a crystal was you heard the actual uh, hish, hiss or crash of the spark. And that was the, uh, the Morse code, you know, da da, da 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 da, whatever. So <clears throat> they built the rock crusher, started about 1914, um, and that became a circuit to Hawaii and then to Japan. So that was very important because Marconi was doing the same thing on the East Coast. So the United States became the center of this worldwide communication system between the Far East and Europe. Uh, and this was all done with, with wireless telegraphy. And in those days, it was all done with these huge spark transmitters. Um, that, changed, that, that changed a little bit. Now, one of the things that was happening at the same time is that uh, a man by the name of Lee DeForest, who came to work in... Uh, Palo Alto in 1911 had invented um, what we talk about as the radio tube and uh, the, the, the radio uh, tube that we know about. So Lee DeForest invented the radio tube, but it wasn't a radio tube at the time, but, but it was a device that uh, would permit um, two things to happen. One is you could make a louder signal so you could amplify, and the other is if you had that amplifier so that it fed back, then you could make it oscillate. And that could generate the same kind of radio signals that had to be sent out when you were doing uh, spark transmissions and whatnot. So Lee DeForest was working in 1911 on, this, uh, on these radio tubes. Now here's one from much later, but um, this was from the 1920s and it's blue. And I'll show you, I'll show you another one in a minute. But the, the um, what he managed to do is <clears throat> get his vacuum tube to oscillate and thereby become the basis for transmissions that could replace those giant huge uh, rock, rock crushers or the later alternators or all the rest of it. Uh, and this was an important device. Some people say that the, uh, the vacuum tube was the most important invention of the 20th century. And I wouldn't go that far, but it's certainly one of the most important adventures, inventions of the 20th century. So uh, we owe that to Lee DeForest, and he was working in, in Palo Alto at the time. Now, <clears throat> there was another company in Palo Alto by the name of Federal. Actually, Lee was working, Lee DeForest was working for Federal. And instead of having big giant sparks, they had something called an arc, and you needed a big magnet to keep it in the right place, but it was a lot more efficient. And so they made a lot of these and sold them to the Navy, and it was the main way to communicate across the Atlantic, for example, in uh, 19, uh, 1917 and 1918 during the First World War. And that particular system was one million watts. So that's a lot of power, uh, but it worked, and it got, it got the messages across. So <clears throat> in this period, say from 1899 to 1919, or 1920 or so, 
you really had a development not only on the west coast but throughout the world from a very primitive technology that used little sparks and, and uh, little crystals and things like that to a very sophisticated technology that involved um, millions of watts of power, uh, huge antenna fields all over the world to, to, to both send the signals out and to get the signals in. Uh, and they, it, it never totally replaced the cables that were running under the oceans, but it gave them enough competition so that when Marconi announced that he'd gotten a signal across the Atlantic in 1901, the cable companies on the stock market in London lost about half of their market value because people could see <laughs> if you've got wireless telegraphy, you don't need wires or cables. So what are we going to do? Now, it's a, that's a long, complicated story after that. But uh, wireless telegraphy and ultimately radio was, was one of the more important um, modes of communication in in the uh, you know, First World War period and then later. So I'd like to show, I'd like to stop now for a minute and then I'll show you another device. What I'd like to talk about now is uh, this device, which is a um, circa hmm, 1915, maybe 1914, 1915, maybe 1920, but uh, not, probably not 1920. Uh, this is a, a spark transmitter and it is also a receiver and this was uh, made here uh, in the Bay Area and we at the museum inherited it in due course and it has two, compo two parts to it. Uh, this part <coughs> is the uh, actual transmitter and the reason I wanted to point out is that this little piece right here is where the spark comes. So you can see this is about um, an eighth of an inch at most. This is a fairly small spark. This is not a 300,000 watt rock crusher. But this would suffice to get you out 100 miles or so. Uh, so uh, and and uh, most of young men built these things for themselves. This is the spark coil from a Ford Model T in all probability. And so it would generate in the automobile, it would generate a spark for the spark plugs. Here it generates a high voltage spark, which then goes into what we call then a condenser, which sort of smooths it out. And then it goes to this spark gap. And when it goes through the spark gap, that's when it generates the radio frequency energy that is going to be ultimately transmitted out. So what you would do is <coughs> you would touch this key for the dots and the dashes of your signal and every time you touch the key you'd get a spark and every time you got a spark the signal would go out to this coil here and from this coil here it would go out to the antenna and so you could uh, happily sit at home with this uh, quite nicely constructed device on your desk and you could send signals to um, certainly all your neighbors but you know on a, on a good a good day maybe a hundred miles um, but you'd have to have a really good antenna and you have to have really good conditions to get a hundred miles out of something like this now the other half of this is basically over here this is the receiver and so we showed you the Halkin coil the, what we call a loose coupler. It has two coils. This has one coil, but it does the same sort of thing. So you could uh, slide this slider and get more or fewer turns, slide this slider and get more or fewer turns, and you would uh, then uh, connect this to your antenna, uh, and you'd use this switch to switch between uh, the antenna for the transmit and the antenna for the receive. And the uh, radio frequency energy would come down and the coil would sort of filter it to what you were most interested in and then it would go to the detector which is right here and that's uh, comparable uh, well, I, I did something oh there's the little detector but th this is the same thing It's a little piece of lead sulfide called galena and it made it possible to uh, hear in a pair of headphones the radio frequency energy that was coming in so th this this kind of device is what amateurs used well up into, well some of them used them into the 1920s, but by about 19, uh, well, let's go back a little bit. During the First World War, all the amateurs were off the air. That was, uh, there was a, a justified fear of German espionage and sabotage. It was a serious, serious matter. The government just shut everybody down. And if you had an antenna on your house, they would come and cut it down for you, <laughs> whether you liked it or not. And so, um, 
there was no activity on the air by amateurs. Of course, there's Army and Navy and all that sort of thing. Um, but up until amateurs were shut down in 1917, almost everybody had a spark transmitter. And that was the way things worked. Now, there were a few experimenters who used vacuum tubes. Lee DeForest had invented them. And <clears throat> even though the companies like the DeForest Company and uh, uh, American Marconi, uh, they wanted to be able to keep control of the vacuum tube market, it wasn't that hard to make a vacuum tube with 19th century technology. So what happened in the period before the First World War is that more and more uh, business people, entrepreneurs, were making vacuum tubes because there was a market. Amateurs wanted to have vacuum tubes. And so they would make vacuum tubes much like this. This is a very early Audiotron made in San Francisco. Now, um, the, uh, the man by the name of George Haller, who was part of Haller Halcon here, is the man who suggested that they put the cylindrical plate in here. And the way it works is there's a filament that makes a lot of electrons. And there's a grid, which you probably can't see here, but it's a cylindrical grid. So a little bit of voltage comes in the grid and it controls a lot of the current that goes from the filament to the, to the plate. So you could use this to amplify. And as I said, if you loop the signal back, you could use it to oscillate. And once you had it oscillating, you were doing what the spark was doing. You were generating a radio frequency energy signal. And then you could send it out to your antenna. Uh, <clears throat> of course, you, you would you want to, as it were, make sure that your circuit is correct for that particular frequency, but people knew how to do that. So this is an extremely rare object because um, it has the, the light bulb base on it. And the light bulb base was what Lee DeForest originally used. And so this is um, very, very early, and it went into a four-pin base later. So I don't know exactly where this came from. I, don't, I do know it's local. And the thing that I know is that because in the West Coast, people were bootlegging these tubes. That is to say, they were not paying the patent royalties or even applying to use them. They were just making them. There were, there were big disputes about, about this. Lead to forest. He was okay with the commercial people because they always paid. But the amateurs never paid. And amateurs were making more and more of these bootleg tubes in San Francisco. And it became a real problem. Now, Marconi didn't want anybody bootlegging the tubes either because they had very early patents, actually a little bit before um, DeForest on similar technology. And um, so there, were, there was a, a, a serious, serious problem involving patents up to the First World War. By the time of the First World War, the government said, we all got, we're all in this together. There are not going to be any patent disputes. We'll settle this after the war. But right now, just make the tubes for the Army and the Navy and everything. So they did that. Uh, but this is, this is an example, an excellent example of a very, very early, perhaps as early as 1910. It's, it's hard to tell. A uh, bootleg tube that violated all of the patent uh, laws. And, and people made a lot of money on them because there were amateurs who had enough money to pay what maybe in today's money be $100, $150 for one of these. Uh, so, you know, it, it really, it, 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 you, had, you had to be relatively rich, but on the other hand, it, it, it freed you from all of this stuff over here. Um, and it also made for extremely capable little receivers. This receiver was dependent entirely on the amount of energy that came down from the antenna into the coil through the detector and into your headphones. If you had a, a tube like this and you could regenerate the signal, and this was what uh, Major Armstrong uh, invented about 1914, you could take an extremely weak signal and you could get it without any problem at all, worldwide. So it was a tube no bigger than this that would permit you to listen to radio stations all around the world if you had a good enough antenna. That was really the limiting factor was the antenna once you had uh, a vacuum tube that could regenerate. So the, the patent issue um, was resolved after the First World War by uh, the Navy getting, creating a monopoly called RCA, Radio Corporation of America, RCA, out of American Marconi and General Electric and Westinghouse and AT&T and United Fruit, which had a lot of communications on the East Coast. They all got together and became the Radio Corporation of America and they pooled their patents. 
So once the patents were pooled, you didn't have to fight about them anymore. RCA got all the patent royalties. Now you say, well, that wasn't going to help the hams too much. Yeah, but what happened was RCA, because at that time radio broadcasting was just coming into play in 1920-21, RCA was making a whole lot of vacuum tubes because they wanted to put vacuum tubes in little radios that people could buy for their homes. Uh, and so it, vacuum tubes stopped being expensive. It was, you know, a little bit like computers, you know, initially very, very expensive, and now they're not very expensive. So it didn't, it didn't make sense to try to bootleg the tubes anymore. You could get them pretty cheap from what turned out to be a local radio store, and they were everywhere in California and San Francisco and Oakland and Los Angeles and New York, whatever. Now, some of the, some of the tubes had, had different purposes. This, this is a 1920s vacuum tube, and um, this was Arcturus, I believe. Uh, it didn't have to be blue, but if you could make them blue, you could sell radio, more radios with blue tubes. So this is entirely a marketing device, okay, to have a blue tube. And some of them were gold. Uh, it was just a marketing device. And we see radios that have odd, from our perspective, kind of odd constructions. Well, why is that? Well, because if you made it look like laboratory equipment, people would pay more for it. So that kind of thing. Now, now this vacuum tube is a, a, a transmitting tube, can also be used for uh, high-powered audio. But it's the same idea. You know, it has a filament up the middle, and it has a, a grid that controls the electrons coming from the filament to the plate, and it has a plate. Now here the plate comes off the top. But it's the same idea. But this would carry, oh, I don't know, 100 times more power than this. So if you wanted to have a transmitter that could, say, get across the uh, Atlantic Ocean in 1916, you'd take a bank of tubes sort of like this, and a whole big bank of them in parallel and generate a lot of power and use that to get across the Atlantic. And that's, that's in fact what happened in 1916, and it was actually voice that got across the Atlantic. So, so what, what the, the history of California in this area was that it was uh, a, a very, the people in California were very early uh, attuned to the uh, commercial and, and even social possibilities of, of wireless communication. Start out wireless telegraphy. By the end of the First World War, people were talking about broadcasting news and music and, and uh, highly um, elevating programs and whatnot. Uh, there was no real commercial, uh, well, that's not true. The commercials really came in later, but the people who were making the radios, like RCA, wanted to tell other people who were listening to some of the radios to come buy more radios. So they're already selling stuff on the radio as soon as the radio uh, went into place. We had, we had broadcasting stations in California as early as 1912, but it did not use vacuum tube technology. It used that earlier ARC technology, but it was probably the first regular broadcasting station. But after the First World War, everybody used the vacuum tubes, including all of the California stations. And so the First World War was a, was a huge watershed between the more primitive systems and the more sophisticated systems that eventually evolved into things like transistors and computers and everything else. Um, but it was the people before the First World War that made all of that possible. And they were the experimenters, the amateur radio operators. Almost everybody who was in the electronics business through the 1980s had been an amateur radio operator first, including even, even Steve Wozniak of the Apple computer. He was first an amateur radio operator. And so, um, you know, that, that's less true these days, but for a while, the, the, the people had the initiative to go ahead and put together a little system that could communicate around the block or around the world. These were the people who then went into business, and they powered so much of uh, California's industry. And of course, in the Second World War, that became very important with, with war production. Uh, so the, the, the early stages of wireless or radio in California was, was foundational to a great deal of California's uh, economic success right through, the, right, through, right through the 1980s, I would say. And a lot of it goes back to people who are willing to put something like this together, uh, a, a bootleg, patent violating, but extremely useful uh, little device with which you could literally hear around the world.
by sitting at your desk with a you know a couple of coils and a and a pair of headphones and that that's really all you needed so so we're very proud of the the role that uh, uh, California early California in this area in California played in uh, early wireless and uh, and radio thank you very much you're welcome